Grab your Bibles. Let's get into the Word of God today. I am thrilled to continue our series, Everyday Miracles. Uh, if you get your Bibles, go with me to 2 Kings chapter number 13, chapter number 13. And uh, once you got your Bibles, if you didn't get a message out when you walked and lift your hands, I should give that to you. If you're watching online, you're in the room with us. Welcome. Uh, if you're here for the first time, I'm Josiah Silva. I'm the lead pastor of Freedom House Church, and it's my honor to serve the amazing congregation here at Freedom House. Once you got your message out in your Bible, would you do me a favor? Stand to your feet for the reading of the Word of God. I want to talk to you today and divinely discomfort, discomfort you to not accept anything but total victory that God has for you. That you would no longer look at any area of your life and submit yourself to partial victory. But I believe the God that we serve didn't die partially. He died a complete death and fully rose again. Come on now! So that we could have complete victory, okay? And I want to talk about today, in the verses we're about to read, Elisha, the series that we've been on, is going to talk to King Joash about having complete victory. Someone say complete victory. And he's going to challenge Joash to not settle for partial victory. Well, partial victory and so I want you to so just receive this here second Kings chapter 13 verse 14 through 19 watch what the Bible says here here's Elisha at the end of his life and the Bible says now Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died but Joash king of Israel went down to see him before he died and wept over him and said my father my father he cried the chariots and the horsemen of Israel Elisha said to King Joash who was worried because they were going to be overtaken and now the man of God was dying. Elijah said, get a bow and some arrows and he did so. In verse 16 he said, take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. And when he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Then the scripture says, open the east window. Which window? East window, he said. And he opened it. Then he said, shoot, Elijah said, and he shot. Someone shout, take a shot. Tell your neighbor, say, take a shot. He said, shoot the Lord's arrow. And then he, and when he shot it, he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows. Someone shout, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times. And then what did he do? He... He stopped. Notice this. Three times, then he stopped. How many times did he strike the ground? And then he stopped. In verse 19, watch this here because it's about to flip the script. The Bible says the man of God was angry with him and he said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will only defeat it three times. In other words, the level of your obedience will determine the level of your victory. And I came to preach to somebody and I want to preach you into no longer settling for level three, but I want you to go to level complete that God has for your life. Come on, shout amen. So today the title of my message, I'm a little fired up. I won't deny because Pastor Marie preached a great message yesterday and I'm ready to roll. Come on. But I want to preach to you today. The title of my message is give it all you got. Say it with me. Say give it all you got give it all you got because you have three options in life. Number one, you can give up. Number two, you can give in. Or number three, you can give it all you got. And I know you didn't come to church to give up. You didn't drive through that traffic to give in. You came to church because you're going to give it all you got. Come on, somebody see God do something good. Let's pray one more time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. Manifest yourself in this room in power and in love, God. Saturate us with the love of the Father, and God, move us to the place of victory you've called us to be. Lord, help us to not settle in any area of our lives, but to fully submit to your plan for our hearts, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Someone shout, amen. Come on, you may be seated. Give God one more clap, because we like to do that in church, and then turn to your neighbor, bug them for me, and just tell them, give it all you got. Tell them that, say, give it all. And some of you that from the old school say, give, 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 give it all you got. Okay, no, no, don't do that. All right. <laughs> Sorry. My mind works like that. Pray for your, your pastor. Amen. Come on. But we got to give it all we got. Let me start here in, you know, some opening thoughts, and then I'll get to the context of the particular story that we just read. And I want to start by saying is we've been on this series, Everyday Miracles. And if you're joining us for the first time, uh, you know, we've been studying the life of Elisha the prophet, mighty, mighty man of God. 
I encourage you, now we got, you know, so many ways that you can go back and listen to the previous messages. We're on the fifth installment of this series entitled Everyday Miracles, so you can go online, podcast, YouTube, and watch the previous messages. Uh, you know, you Netflix binge, might as well binge on the Word of God. Come on, somebody. But uh, you can go back and, and, and join them. But what we've been discussing in this series is we're calling it Everyday Miracles because we serve a God that wants to be involved in your life every day. Okay, we don't just serve a God on Sunday. Amen. You know, we serve the God of every day. And the God that we serve is wanting to do things through our lives in our everyday life. He doesn't just want to move powerfully in your life on a Sunday morning for an hour and 15 minutes. Who am I, who am I joking? Hour and 35 because I preach a little long. Come on. You know what I mean, all right? But, you know, the God we serve goes beyond just our Sunday morning experience. And what we've been noticing through the life of Elijah is that every time he comes upon a situation, there is an impossibility that's presented to him. However, Elisha always trusts in God, and God comes through. So Elisha doesn't wake up that morning and is like, let me go look for the miraculous. Not that he's not expecting or believing it. But the reality is, when an issue comes to him, he responds by faith, and God shows up. And what I'm trying to posture our church is to be this type of believer, double portion believer. That as we go through life, that we are prepared because we know the God of the miraculous. So that when something metaphorically, you know, blows up on your phone or goes haywire in your life, that we don't freak out, but instead we respond in faith. That we say, man, I, I've been reading how God moves through the life of Elijah. In fact, the book of James says that Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed and the rain stopped. What's the point? Is that he prayed and he was a man. And if we could be the same type of men and women that say, when I'm going through my everyday life, I may not have the songs or, or Pastor Josiah's message or, or someone singing. I may not see my church family, but I got God with me on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And God, you could do a miracle. You could do something miraculous. Because this is how, listen to my heart, we're going to win the world to Jesus. I love what happens in church. I, I love church. Man, it brings me to tears when I think about the goodness of God and how many souls have been saved here and restored and transformed. But it doesn't stop here. Okay, So it doesn't stop with our Sunday morning experience. It, it's Here's where we're supposed to get charged up, filled. And then we go to our respective workplaces, our homes. We go to our friends, our coworkers, and it just spills out of our life into their life. And their faith starts getting built up, and they're like, I have never been to your church. In fact, they may never even come to this church, but the fact that they've seen your life causes them to have a thirst for the God that we serve. That they're like, I want what you got. What do you got? Are you high or what's up? You're like, nah, man. I got the most high. Talk to me. Come on now, right? You're like, man, what? You're like, I got the mo I got Jesus. I, I got this inexpre inexplainable joy that the world didn't give me, and the world can't take it away. I, I didn't find it in a bottle. I didn't find it in a person. I found it in the Word, and I found it in heaven. This is how the church will change nations. This is how, let me just start here because that may overwhelm you. This is how you will change your home. This is how we can transform our marriages and our children and in our workplaces to, to bring Christ into that area is when we, the church, come on now, we start saying, God, you want to do something through my life, and it's not just during the song service or during Pastor Josiah's message to feel the goosebumps, but it's so that when I step into an ungodly workplace, come on, don't raise your hand if you work at an ungodly workplace, and your boss is like Satan, except for the church staff, because their boss is good. Come on, somebody. Right? You're like, and your boss is like Satan, or you step in your work, and the culture is so ungodly, or you go to a place, you're like, man, well, oh, but you go in there, and you're like, I'm full of light, I'm full of the power of God, I'm full of Christ, I got the favor of God, the shield of heaven surrounds me, this is what will change the world. And I, I want to say that before I get into what I'm going to talk about, because we, we have the victory. Okay, We have the victory. The devil is a defeated foe. He already lost on the cross. I feel like I'm rapping. Don't be snapping. Okay, you follow me, all right? Okay. He already lost on the cross. So the devil is a defeated foe. He lost. So when the enemy tries to mess with you, you need to tell him, you already lost, bro, okay? You are, you already, you are already defeated. You're under D's feet. Come on, somebody. <laughs> right. And so our battle when we wake up in the morning 
is not to fight the devil. Our battle is to take everything that God has given us, every territory, every place, come on now, and to set up now the stronghold of God in that place. Break the strongholds of Satan and put a stronghold. Now my life has, is ha now God has a stronghold on my life. Now I will say that, that those territorial places are not always physical. Many times it's mental. Territory in our minds that we say, God, I want you to take back this territory. It could be emotional. It could be spiritual. And so God wants to do everyday miracles. Tell your neighbor, say, God wants to do everyday miracles. Say every day, every day, every day, every day. He wants to be part of our lives on Monday, even on Saturday night. I got one woo from the back. Come on now. Yeah. No, not Saturday night, Lord, because that's my time to, yeah, you know, no, no. Every day, Friday night, Saturday night, morning time, God, everyday miracles. Because I don't know about you, but I need God every day. I need God every day. There's not a day I can't, I could take, oh, God, I'm good today. No, no, Lord, I need you today, okay? Now, you know what I mean? Like, Lord, I need you. These kids, I need you, Lord. Come on, parents, help me out. You love, I, I need you with this one. It's the chamaco. This kid, like, give me a double portion. You know what I mean? Some of you, your spouse, don't point. You're like, I need you today, Lord. <laughs> Somebody, amen. Someone shout everyday miracles. You see, God wants to bring us to our life. Now, I want to make this statement, then I'll get into the context here, is what God has put in you is for earth, not for heaven. Let me say it better. The gift that God has put in you is for earth, not for heaven. We don't need your gift in heaven. Okay? In heaven, we don't need you to preach. Everybody's already saved. Okay? We don't need you to prophesy. I got a word for you. I don't need it. God's right there. I'll go talk to him. Okay? We don't need you to open a business in heaven. We don't need you to give in heaven. It's good. The streets are made out of gold. It's solid. Like It's good. Okay? Your gift is only for earth. And what we don't realize on earth will hinder people from making it to heaven. And I want to stir this up inside our church this morning, okay? I'm on, I'm on an assignment from heaven. I, I really pray by the end of this message, you grab my heart. If you join us for the first time, you're like, man, you're getting deep. And I love you, okay? Just stay, you know, y'all follow me, okay? It is, is God wants us to pour this out. Now, I said all that because this is what's happening in the context of what we just read. Elijah the prophet is helping Joash the king get out everything that's supposed to be in his destiny. God didn't want Joash, the king of Israel, to have partial victory over his enemy. God wanted Joash to have total and complete victory over what was fighting him over his enemy. And so what ends up happening is the Bible tells us in verse 14, we'll go through this verse by verse, we've been reading the book of 2 Kings, is in verse 14, the scripture tells us that Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Now, I, I want to just take a little sidestep, and then I'll get back into kind of the vein I want to show here. But I think it's important that we understand that here, Elijah, go to verse 14 if you can for me. I'd love you forever and a day. Now, Elijah had been suffering from an illness that he would die. I want you to see that Elijah is a man of God doing miracles, but he gets sick too. So I just, let me take a little sidestep real quick and just say that you could be a person that is saved, praying miracles for other people, and you might get sick. That doesn't mean God's not with you. Okay, this body is broken, this body is frail, this body, you know, unfortunately, it's a sin that entered into the flesh, and, and, it's, and the Bible says that we, we're perishing outwardly, but inwardly we're being renewed daily. And so I just want to just say that, that don't get mad at God when someone dies, or perhaps you get an illness and think God's not with me. Even Elisha got sick, okay? But he was still a man of God, and this was a way that God was going to transition Elisha. Obviously, dying here is not the end. It's just the beginning of eternity. When you close your eyes to the physical, you open your eyes to the spiritual when we die. And so here Elijah's getting sick. And, and again, if you have a sick love when you go, man, God, where are you? Look, if you're real, how come my grandma's sick or how come this is sick? No, listen, even Elijah got sick, okay? And, and, and it's, it's, it's a part of life that, that I pray, again, we believe in divine healing. We believe that, that God, God, no premature death, and God will let you live a long, full life. But even Elisha got sick. In fact, I could even preach, have you ever prayed miracles for other people, but some reason ain't working for you? You ever that? Like, Lord, I pray for them. They get healed. And then me, what's up, Lord? You know? That doesn't mean you don't have faith. Even Elisha was in that place, okay? So the Bible, okay, that was a little sidestep, then get back on this track, okay? So, so, so I won't go down that bunny trail or else we'll end up somewhere completely different, right? But Elisha's sick, the scripture says, and what ends up taking place here 
is Joash, the king of Israel, comes to visit Elisha because now he's afraid, like if the man of God dies, King Joash didn't have quite the relationship with God to guide God's people. So he comes to, to Elisha. He says, Elisha, you know, my, he says, my father, my father. And he's crying. He's weeping. He's like, you know, the chariots of, of Israel, the horses are coming. In other words, you're going to die. And, and I don't know what to do. So he's asking him, can, can you help us one last time? Because we're about to be overcome by the enemy. So Elisha does what Elisha has been doing in this whole series we've been looking at. He says, get a bow and some arrows. And as we've been studying this, every time Elisha is always asking people to do something very uncommon, go get some empty vessels, go dip yourself in the Jordan. It, Elisha's always trying to get people to get out of their comfort zone to experience the miraculous. And I think there's a message even in there, people of God, that we won't, we won't see the supernatural if we're always trying to be super normal. We won't always see the miraculous if we're always trying to only open our eyes to what's natural. we got to say, God, I will do even the uncommon thing. Move me out of my comfort zone because I want to see you do something amazing. Shout amen. Come on, talk to me, somebody, all right? I, I love the comfy chairs we have, but the truth is it's not. we don't want to make you comfortable in church. We're trying to make you uncomfortable, amen. Now you're like, what? We'll keep the comfy chairs. Chill out, all right? Chill out. But, you know, the goal is to get you uncomfortable. Say, I don't want to just stay where I'm at. I want God to do something great in my life. So what ends up taking place here, let me set the contextual background, is he tells them, take some bows and some arrows, and I'm going to tell you how your deliverance is going to come. So, so come on out here if you can with my bows and arrows. You know, you know me. Props with the props. Here we go. Come on, somebody. Come on out. And uh, this is Anthony, and he's single, by the way. Anyway, all right, I'll just leave that one alone. I'm trying to hook you up, bro. Anyway. But if you do get married, name your first child Josiah. Anyway, so praise the Lord. <laughs> okay. He tells them, grab a bow and arrow, okay? And when he tells them to do this, the king's like, well, what are we going to do here, right? So he's going to stay with me, all right? Let me set the contextual background, and we'll get down to business here in a moment. And he's like, what I want you to do, the scripture says, he says, take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. And we had taken it. Elisha goes and puts his hands on, I'm not trying to get weird, okay? But he puts his hands on, on his hands. Come over here, okay? And what he does is the scripture then says, Elijah says, open the east window. We're facing the wrong way. Okay, this way, east. I know my east to west. Come on now. So if I wouldn't be sitting that, if you're sitting in that chair, and I'm just joking. Come on now, right? So notice it's empty in that corner, right? So, so he says, open the east window. And he says, and I'm going to, and he says, when the east window's open, Elijah's going to tell him, don't, don't shoot it, okay? He's going to say, shoot. And the Bible says, Elijah said, the Lord's error of victory over victory of Aram, Elijah declared, for you will completely destroy the, the, uh, the, and destroy the Arameans at Aphex. So he tells him, shoot. So shoot it, but don't shoot it hard. Just, yeah, don't kill nobody, okay? Boom. That was pretty good. Good thing nobody's over there. All right. Uh, it's, a, it's a dull arrow, okay? Just stay with me. Oh, my God, that was so unsafe. We crazy at church. No, but not that crazy. All right. Okay, I had to, anyway, all right, focus, squirrel, Lord help me, all right. He, he shoots it, and when Elijah shoots it, the Bible says, I'm sorry, when, the, when Joash shoots it, the Bible says that Elijah declares, the Lord, go back to the previous verse, he says, the Lord arrows, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram. Someone shout victory. So he says, when he shot it, Elijah was like, victory is going to come when you shoot this arrow, and you're going to win the battle at Aphek. One battle. Not the war, just that battle. So he showed him the first one. Then Elijah says in the next verse, he says, take up some more arrows and strike the ground. So grab another arrow. Did they give you another one? Oh, you already got it. You're hardcore. All right, he's ready to go. So he says, take up the arrows and strike the ground. Now, before I prepared for this, I used to think that when he said strike the ground, let me borrow your arrow, that he told him to do this. But that's not what he said. I'm not going to throw the arrow, by the way. Just, okay. When he said strike the ground, the vernacular there was do the exact same thing you just did, but this time shoot it just to the ground out the window. Okay? So he's saying what you just did right now, in other words, I showed you the first one, now I want you to do the second one. 
okay? And so he says, take the arrow and just strike the ground out the window, just shoot it towards the east, he says, and go ahead. So Elisha, Joash knew, stay with me, okay, like, where are we going with this? Just, okay, I'm not trying to make you no know, Katniss Everdeen, okay, just stay focused, all right? Is, he says, now shoot it. So then the Bible says he shot it three times, and then what did he do? What did he do? He stopped. So just, let's just say he shot it. I don't want to kill nobody. Okay, boom, all right? And then he stopped, put down the arrow, bow and arrow. So Joash felt like the man. It's like, that's right. I did it three times. What's up, y'all? But then watch this. Okay, we have to get real here. The Bible then says the man of God got angry with him. He's like, really, bro? He got upset with him. Now, when you look at the scripture, the surface, you're almost like, are you having a bad day, Elijah? You okay, man? Like, he did what you said. But he reveals why he got upset because he says, you should have struck it five to six times. But instead, he says, I'm sorry, if you would have done, you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed him, but now you will only have three victories. The reason why he gets upset is because he says, you could have kept shooting as many arrows and you would have had as many victories as the number of arrows you were willing to shoot. But instead, you settled for only three arrows when you could have just shot all seven, eight arrows that you had. So you were happy with only three shots when you could have just took every shot towards your enemy and had complete victory. And here is the point that I want to preach today. Could it be that we are not shooting every arrow that God has given us in his word to see complete victory over the enemy that's trying to go over you and we're settling for just shooting a couple arrows on Sunday, but we ain't shooting no arrows on Monday. We ain't shooting no arrows on Tuesday. I'm trying to breach this morning. Come on, somebody. Tell your neighbor, say, take a shot. So he says, you should, man, you should have done it five to six times. So you're, you're good with three? Like three. Three. That's it. Three. He's like, you're the king. And you're happy with just three victories? You should have kept shooting those arrows and not stopped until you had nothing more to shoot. He's like, Three. That's all you got? Three? Like three. Three. Could it be that we get happy with minimums when it comes to God? <laughs> now, I'm not picking out nobody gets quiet at church. I know I'm stepping on some toes. Amen. A... But could it be we get happy? Well, I've said three prayers before. Three and three. Yeah, you got three victories, but you could have had complete victory over every area of your life. Could it be that we get happy singing just three songs a week on Sunday morning? Three. God says, they're good with three. Like you could have complete victory. And you good with three? Could it be that we got like three scriptures memorized? I'm, I know I'm stepping on to agony. No amens this scripture. I mean this service. No amens. I know. That we get happy. With, I got three. I know three. John 3, 16. I got that one down. I got it down. I'm ready to roll, Pastor. And then every guy knows Ephesians 5, 25. Uh, wives, submit to your husband. Can, come on. They got that one. <laughs> every guy knows that verse. I go, Amen, Pastor. I got that one down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could it be that we're happy with three verses? Could it be that, that we, we are settling for partial victory when we can have complete victory? Could it be that, that maybe the reason we're not seeing God at the level that we should see him work in our lives is because we're just shooting a few arrows when we can shoot every arrow that the Bible has given us to shoot against the enemy? Come on, clap if you're going to clap. Come on, shout to the Lord if you're going to shout to the Lord. Come on, someone shout. Give it all you got. So I want you to write this down. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. He's still single. All right, number one, write this down. How are we going to see complete victory is you got to use the arrows that are in your hand. You've got to use the arrows 
that are in your hand. Oh, don't take, don't take my prop, man. Bring it back. Don't take, don't, trying to jack my arrows, man. Come on, somebody. Leave it out here. You got to use the arrows. Yeah, just put it down right there. You're good. Thank you so much. Well, you might be saying, Pastor Josiah, what kind of arrows are those? Like, like I, I, you know, I, I'm not no Robin Hood. I ain't got no arrows. You know what I mean? What am I talking about? What I'm talking about are, for example, arrows of prayer. Arrows like fasting. Arrows like worship. Arrows like praise. Arrows like the word. Arrows like tithing. Arrows like holy living. Arrows of faith. Arrows of community with fellow believers. Arrows of praying together. Arrows of forgiveness. Arrows of unity. Arrows of holiness. Arrows of, po- uh, come on now. Arrows of love. Arrows of joy. Could it be that we are not using all the arrows God has given us? But instead, we just, I did a few arrows, Lord, back in 1974. He says, you should have done it five to six times. You should have. Like, you settled for three when you could have just seen God bring total victory. Questions I like to ask. Are you using all the arrows God gave you? This is the question. Just a question. Are you using all the arrows God gave you? Because so many believers, oftentimes we use some arrows, but not all of them. Like, are you using all the arrows? Like, have you you used the arrow of fasting? You're like, I drove fast here. I ate fast food. Does that count, Pat? No, that don't count. Come on, man. But some believers will go the whole Christian walk and never use the arrow of fasting. And wonder why they don't see the complete victory. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. The whole life. I thought thought I heard that in the Bible. I was was thinking about that one time. Have you ever used the arrow of worship? No, no, no. I I know you hear us singing songs. But have you used the arrow, like really used the arrow of worship? Or, or, or do you come to church and, and look at them perform and like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a nice light show. Oh, look, a nice person over there. Oh, yeah, oh, they came to church. Why are they wearing the same shirt I'm wearing? Come on, man, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, they just do this because people show up late, and then, they, and then after the, the, the service will really start once everybody comes. So they just sing a few songs. And, they, and No! Have you used your arrow of worship? And said, Lord, if your word declares that you inhabit the praises of your people and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Then I'm going to use my arrow of worship on Sunday morning, on Monday morning, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. I'm going to use it in the hospital room. I'm going to use it when I'm facing my bills. I'm going to use it when I get sick. I'm going to use it when my child is getting bullied. I'm going to use my arrows because I want total victory. Someone shout, use your arrows. Have you used the arrow of tithing? They got quiet in this Christian church. Come on, somebody. Because some Christians will go their whole life and never use that arrow. I heard about ties, ties. Like, we're a tie? I wore a tie. What is that? Have you used that arrow? Because some will be like, I tip God. That's not tithe. The heavens won't open with tips. They open with tithe. And they'll go their whole life and struggle financially. And why, why, can, why can't I do this? How come I can't get ahead? They have no blessing of God because you haven't used that arrow. Have you used the arrow of forgiveness? Or is that arrow still sitting in your Bible and it got literally the devil's face on it and the and God's like, if you would just, you, if you just would have done it five to six times, you would have experienced complete and total victory in every area of your life, but you settled for three. Come on, man. He got like, not like angry, like, what's wrong with you, fool? It was like, come on, man. It's like me, come on, Lakers, come on, man, come on. Like, anyway, sorry, I let that out. It's like, come on, man. He got angry, like, are you for real? Like, like you have this whole arsenal at your fingertips, and you ain't going to use everything God gave you, Joash? Which is proof that our breakthrough is not in the arsenal we have, but the arsenal we use. I'll say it again. Our breakthroughs are not in the arsenal we have, but the arsenal we use. You can have a Bible, but it won't do you no good until you actually use. I'm preaching real good. I wish I had some better amens. Until you use. Have you used the arrow of prayer? 
Or you just use it for your food. Lord, bless this food. Maybe a nourishment to our bodies. That ain't going to be a nourishment to your body. I don't care what you pray. Come on. <laughs> this double cheeseburger right now. Just, Lord, let it be a nourishment to our body. That is not. <laughs> Come on. Have you used the arrow prayer? I, I could, I could, have, you, have you really used it? Because, see, the reason why Elisha got mad was because Joash was just haphazardly, you know. Okay, yeah, okay, three, okay. One, two, three. All right, I'm good. And he's like, come on, man. Like, he's like, I'm trying to show you complete victory. You see, this morning, I believe you didn't come to church for partial victory. You came to church for complete victory. I'm going to give you five seconds to give God a praise for the victory he's going to bring in your life. Oh, come on. Don't just be a quiet and acute church. You go ahead. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. Come on. Tell your neighbor. Say, take a shot. Take a shot. Do something, man. Or ladies. He said, open the east window. Why? Because that was the direction of the enemy. You see, he wanted him to look out the window because it was all about vision. You see, victory comes from using what God has given us. I want to show you some verses. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 14, New Living Translation. The Bible says, the Lord will appear above his people. His arrows will fly like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the ram's horn and attack like a whirlwind from the southern desert. You see, when you begin to use the metaphorical arrows that God has given you, God will come on your behalf like a whirlwind on the enemy that is trying to come and attack you. He will come on a whirlwind on that addiction, a whirlwind come on on that demon a whirlwind on that stronghold he'll send a whirlwind because you're responding by faith and shooting some arrows we need some mamas shooting not not arrows of hatred but arrows of prayers to their kids we need some grandmamas come on grandmama don't you stop praying for that child i don't care if he's 50 years old he still needs your prayer we need some fathers now, come on now not just to be thinking about more money think about more god in your kids come on we need some young people that are not just thinking about hooking up but are thinking about keeping connected with god we need some single people that are more fired up about meeting their destiny than meeting somebody we need more churches that will say, I'm going to send my arrow into the cultural world because my arrows are backed up by the whirlwind of heaven. Oh, give them a praise and use the arrow of praise. Shout amen. Tell your neighbor, say, use your arrows. Bro or sis, I don't know what you're sitting next to. You got to use your arrows. He says, that's all you're going to do is three. Because I'll tell you something. I'll let you know who's using the arrows, and they make no apology. Satan is using his arrows. Oh, believe me, the fiery arrows he throws at you every day. I'm telling you right now, Satan will not let up. He throws arrows at you. He throws arrows at your wife. He throws arrows at your kids. He'll throw arrows at your finances. He'll throw those fiery dart of doubt arrows at your faith. He throws arrows at your mind. And here we are just getting all arrowed up. And God says, do you know that I have given you victory over your... If you just would have done it five or six, if you just would have used all your arrows... You would have had total victory. Come on, man. I like Elijah. He's like, if you just wheeze it all. You see, what Elijah was showing Joash, he was showing him that Joash, your lack of faith will stand in the way of what God really wants to do in your life. I'm going to show you this next verse. Here's a heavy one, okay? Tell your neighbors, it's a good one, but it's a heavy one. In Psalms chapter 78 and verse 40 and 42, the psalmist begins to account how the nation of Israel was being taken to the promised land, how they had got God upset in the wilderness and complained. And this is what he says here in verse 40. He says, how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved God, him being God, in the desert. Watch verse 41. Yes, again and again, what did they do? They tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Some of your translations will say provoked, but in the original Hebrew, it means literally to limit God on what he'll do on behalf of their life. The Bible declares that God's people, they limited what God could do in their life because of their disobedience. That God was like, I would love to do that, but the fact is, you don't believe me all the way. Which is amazing, because think about this. 
we have the ability to limit what God will do through our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't get saved to limit God. I, I'm not coming to church to limit God. I'm not, I didn't, I, I'm not trying to live a life that is limited, and I prophesy that you would break every limitation that has been tried to be put on your life, and that God, come on somebody, would break through. Someone say, no limitations. In fact, say this, say, remove the lids. The Bible says they limited God, but notice what this says here. Put it back up to our preacher from the screens. It says, yes, again and again, what did they do? They tempted God. Now, when you read that, you say, what, how did they tempt God? They tempted God, and here's how people tempt God, is they tempt God by not listening to his word. And what did they tempt God? It's not that they tempt God to, to sin, but they tempt God to bring his judgment and correction. I'm not getting no amens on this, but it's all right. I'm going to preach anyway. God is patient, but make no mistake, he disciplines those he loves. I got two amens and a couple stairs. All right. He's patient. No mistake. He's God. He's dad. Well, that's not fair. No, it's fair. Dads, I know you'll shut me down. It's like your kid going, I crashed your car. But that's not fair, dad. I don't deserve discipline. You're like, squeeze me. I'm under grace. Well, check this out. Come here. Let me show you. Come on, somebody. Okay. So we all know as dads, that's perfectly fair. God's the same way. God says, I won't bless your disobedience. In fact, he'll be patient, but sooner or later, he's going to bring correction. And the Bible says they tempted God, and God was like, you are tempting me to regulate up in this place. <laughs> Mamas, you know what I'm talking about, because your kids will tempt you. Because you'd be like, you better stop that. Kids go, Mom was like at a five right now. She's not serious. <laughs> hey. Come on, mamas, help me out. And then they'll keep doing it, and you go, you better stop that. They're like, mom's like an eight and a half. She's cool. She's not that. Then you're like, you better stop that. They're like, she's at a 10. I better back up right now. Don't even look at mama right now. She will send you. Come Anyway, I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> right? And mama's know that. God's the same way. He's like, he's patient, but make no mistake. The Bible says they tempted him. And God's like, I'm about to regulate if you don't get right. He loves you. And you ought to welcome that from the Lord. I'm trying to preach the full gospel up in this house. Come on, somebody clap like we got, we're still preaching. The, come on, somebody. I, I know God wants to bless you, and I preach that. But I got to preach God also wants to chastise those he loves. God wants to sharpen you. Come on, help me out, Amen. He says they tempted God. Then it says this, and they and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited God. That, 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 that is... What do you think about that? You're limiting the unlimited God through my level of obedience and faith. So my question is, where are you limiting God in your life? Where are you limiting him in your life? Where have you placed the limit? Because you're not fully obeying him in that area. I want you to experience all God has for you. We need to see God move every day in our schools. We need to see God move every day at our workplace. We need to see God move every day in our homes. We need to see God move, come on, in, in parenting. We need to see God move, come on, men. We need to see God move in women. We want God every day, but I'm not going to limit you, God. We gotta remove lids. How do you remove them? Write this down here. Are two areas you gotta remove limitations. And number one, you gotta remove limitations that other people set on you. Okay. So don't limit what God wants to do in your life through what other people said about you. Because people will put limits on you. They'll say, You'll always be like that. Be like, No, I'm not. Don't you put that limitation on me. They'll say, You're never gonna get better than me. You messed up a good thing. You say, watch. I'm talking to dating people. Come on, somebody. Amen. I was the best thing you would ever have. Watch. Don't you put that limit on me. Don't let nobody put a limit on you. You'll never be a manager. You'll never, you'll never, you'll never experience. You'll always be an addict. You'll always be the wino. You'll always be the, the sad. You'll always be the worry war. You, the devil is a liar. You might see that, but I don't see that. I'm going to remove that limitation, and I'm going to let God do what he wants to do in my life. Come on, shout amen. 
You got to remove limitations that other people put on you. I'm going to take them off. I, don't, don't you put any of those limitations. Don't you, stick, don't you let that be on your life. You break that. You break that. People tell you, people like you don't succeed. Watch what God can do. And then number two, just write this. Other limitations you got to break is you got to remove the limits you place on yourself. Remove them. Because some of you, you place limits on yourself. You know, I'm dumb. I'm so dumb. I, if, I, if I was just cuter, if I was just taller, if I was just a few pounds like if I had more hair, if I was just, you know, take Oh, if I could just speak better. Oh, if I just had a better resume. Oh, if I just... Take the limits that you place on yourself. God is bigger than whatever issue or limitation you got. Come on, clap and shout amen. I don't want to be known for the lack of faith. I want to give it all I got. Number two, I got to wrap this up. Let me land this plane. You got to use the arrows you have. And number two is don't stop releasing the arrows. Don't stop. You can't just do it one time and then be good. This is something we got to continuously do. This is why the prophet got mad at Elijah. It's like, come on, man. You should have done it five or six times. And you should wake up every morning and be like, it's arrow moving time, you know? Because I want breakthrough in my region. I want breakthrough in my life. I want breakthrough. You got to keep shooting and use everything God has given you. But the Bible says, and I want to show you here in verse 18, then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. And Elijah told him, strike the ground. And he struck it how many times? And then what did he do? Stopped. He stopped shooting the arrows when he should have been continuously doing. So my question is, what has caused you to stop shooting arrows that God has given you? Perhaps maybe you're in this place and you used to shoot metaphorical arrows of prayer, metaphorical arrows of the word, metaphorical arrows of fasting, and maybe something has caused you to stop being on track and shooting those metaphorical arrows to see breakthrough. I don't know what has caused you to stop. And you know, what happened was the Bible just says he stopped. We don't know why he stopped. He might have stopped because he thought it was enough. He might have stopped because he's like, you know, I don't want to do too much. He might have stopped because maybe he was like, I didn't like the way that guy was looking at me when I was doing it. Like he looked at me kind of funny and he was like judging me. And so like he kind of looked at me like, like you know, oh, I thought you were a Christian, bro. I'm trying to shoot arrows. And then he like looked at me, so I just stopped. And so someone sat in my seat and though therefore I stopped shooting arrows. You know, you know, I I was, I was dating a Christian, but then the Christian cheated on me, so I just stopped serving God. What, uh, you know, I, I don't know what causes people. Someone offended you, or what would cause you to stop? Don't you stop shooting arrows no matter what happens or who's in the room. You didn't come for them. You didn't come for her. You didn't come for that. You came to shoot arrows, and I'm going to wake up every day, and I'm going to shoot me some arrows until I see breakthrough, and I'm not going to let what my dad did to me, what my mom mom did to me, what a Christian did to me, what a church did to me, what a person did to me, what a hurt did to me, whether you're sick, whether you're good, whether you're broke, whether you got a bonus, whether you got a job or you got no job, I'm going to shoot arrows because God is faithful. Come on, shout amen. Someone shall take a shot. I'm getting fired up. I know. I'm almost done. I want to pray for you. I want to read you this last scripture. Stand to your feet. Jeremiah chapter number 13. Put this on the screens here. I'm sorry, 29, 13. Jeremiah 29, 13. The Bible says this. It says, and you will seek me. Watch this here. The prophet Jeremiah declares this to the people of God. And he says, and you will seek me and find me. When? When what? How? So he says, you're going to find me when you search for me with all your heart so god's like you're gonna find me but when you don't approach me half ways half hearted half in i love my kids they give me endless analogies to preach come on somebody <laughs> you know but i love telling the story with the scripture because it just matches so well is my son judah and I'm, by the way i'm not picking on my son judah my daughter faith she's she's crazy too she's cute and she's crazy come on know anybody cute and crazy don't point come on somebody anyway but <laughs> that's a whole nother story for another day <laughs> but, uh, hey whoa, whoa. so anyway my son judah we're on our way to school 
And this particular morning, you know, we're on time. Like, come on, hurry up. We got to go. We got to go. You know, which is more mornings than not. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And so when they're, I'm like, get your, get your jacket. It was a couple years ago because it's cold. And, you know, and you're probably going to lose that one too. But anyway, get the jacket. So I say, go in your room. It's on your chair right there in your room. Get the jacket. So I'm in the car. Just run, bro. So he runs. I can't find it. I'm like, Judah, it's in your room on the jacket. It's on the, it's on the chair. It's a blue jacket. It has wool on the inside. I know. Go get your jacket. Hurry up. We got to go. Runs over there. Comes back. It's not there. It's about this time as a good dad that I am, you know, I was like, I'm going to find it. And when I do, you know what I mean? So I get out of the car. I go in the room. Guess what? Come on, parents. It's right there. Right where I told them. Hanging just like I said. The color that I, come on, somebody. You know, parents, you know what I'm talking about. It's right there. I grab the jacket. I said, here it is. But here's the fact. Why didn't you find it? Because this is how he went to look for the jacket. It's not there. Go back. It's not there. Could it be that that's how we approach God in church? Could it be that that's why we don't find God in some of the biggest issues? Because we walk into church and go, he's not there. We walk into the Bible, he's not there. We walk into fasting, he's not there. We walk into prayer, he's not there. And God's like, I'm right there because there's a lot of other people finding God where you say he's not. So maybe it's not that God's not there. Maybe it's that you're just not searching with all your heart for the total and complete breakthrough. Come on, give a praise. Sing this out.